Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us again tonight uh, for the podcast episode 43. Um, once again, uh, Kevin and Anthony join us, and our special guest tonight is Chris Hagen, uh, the uh, director of animal management from the Turtle Survival Alliance. So, Chris, uh, awesome to have you with you. We're really excited to have you on and uh, get to talk to you about some of your experiences you've had uh, working with turtles, conserving turtles, and just um, being you. Um, so I know uh, <clears throat> I know Anthony and Kevin are really excited, so um, hopefully our audience is too. Um, by the way, our audience, Anthony, uh, is probably just going to be audio only, but you get to see that, you know, picture of him from like, I don't know, a half decade ago, looking, looking nice and trim. So Very enjoy him and the Hamiltoni while he talks. I look good. I look good. Let's, I'm going to do this every time. I looked better back then. We all admit uh, that. So Chris, so we're we really happy to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, so one question that Anthony always asks, and uh, I think it's a great question to start here specifically, is why turtles? Why turtles? Well, why not? You know, you got to be interested in something, and it's just one. It's just the thing that uh, happened to fall into my lap as as a young child. So um, it's just my thing. I, I love turtles. I love I love all kinds of things. You know, I'm really interested in life in general. But you know, turtles. Why the specific obsession? With turtles, you know, who knows? It, it, but it, yeah. it's there and it's always been there. Okay. Awesome. Uh, one of the major questions we wanted to ask you were, um, you know, what was the overall process for, you know, building a facility for the turtles there with the TSA? Oh, well, that's a, a long process. I mean, obviously, from the start of the Turtle Survival Alliance back in 2001, uh, which was kicked off with a huge confiscation out of Hong Kong of uh, you know, several thousand turtles that were imported to the U.S., triaged in Florida, and um, and then sent out on loan to a lot of people. Well, it would have been nice to have a facility. There was always talk of having a facility, potentially finding an old fish farm or something to purchase. But, you know, the cost, the infrastructure to, to get something like that built you know, off the ground, purchase the land, um, the TSA just never had money to do that. So... Um, everything just kind of lined up at the, in the right way at the right time a few years ago to, to kind of make this happen. Um, I was holding a lot of animals uh, you know, for the TSA and, and other people and other, other groups and, and uh, my, my own collection that I had built over the, the decades. And um, this place became available and it just uh, kind of all worked out and there was enough money, enough interest. Uh, it was the time to do it. And uh, a lot of work went into it, though, with, from a lot of people to, to make it happen. And it took years. Obviously, it was started in, in 2013, but um, the planning for it was going on for a couple of years before that. Okay. So the TSA was around from 2001. And from 2001 to 2013 was just the brainstorming of getting the facility up and running? Uh, well, no, it's just something that was always in the back of the minds of everyone. That'd be nice to have a, a facility uh, and yeah. how can we do it. And, and, and then the TSA in the mid 2000s branched out to more field programs, all of the captive um, component of, of, of managing endangered turtles was within zoos, private individuals, universities, uh, other other nonprofit organizations, people that had turtles out on loan, TSA animals, thousands of them have been out there on loan over the past 15, 16 years. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> this was a, a way to to have a, a a base, you know, a center of operations to 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 handle the animal management program. Like we still have thousands of turtles out on loan. They're not all here at this turtle center. We only yeah. focus on certain species. And a certain number of each species. Um, we have, you know, a grow out plan. We don't, we don't have to have thousands of, of, of the species that we target here. So, and then there are other species that we don't keep here at all that are in the TSA collection. They're just out on loan other places. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. The greater, the greater animal management program is well beyond just this facility. Mm -hmm. Now, is it, it's all over the world or is it solely here in the United States? 
Well, the, the U.S. captive population is managed just here and, and here. But the, yes, there are other captive components to TSA programs elsewhere. So the Turtle Survival Center is just an, one program um, of, the, of the Turtle Survival Alliance. Um, okay. uh, it's, it's one captive component program that's in the United States. There are also other programs in, in other countries um, that do have captive components as well. That aren't necessarily Chris, can I? Yeah. Sorry about. Go ahead. Go ahead. Continue. No, it's all right. Go ahead. I was done. Uh, I'm. I'm sorry. I just wanted to try to jump on here because I don't have video and you can't tell when I want to talk. Uh, yeah. I apologize. I, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the the complications of have lending out over a thousand animals to private uh, the private sector. Maybe some of the um, real positive things that have come from that, and then maybe some of the negative things. If you could speak to to both sides, if if that's possible. Well, certainly, you know, one of the plus sides to it is just the capacity of holding hundreds or thousands of, of animals. No, no one facility can really do that effectively without a huge staff and a huge area. Um, so, and you also don't want all of your turtles in one basket. You know, things need to be spread around to different facilities. And, you know, a lot of places don't have the capacity, especially zoos that, that, that work with this, with these, with these species. And, uh, they only have the capacity for so many animals uh, that they can hold. And um, the Turtle Survival Center here expands on that because we have acreage, lots of acreage, and so we can actually have small populations of these animals here. But beyond that, there's still a lot of offspring. There's still, these animals need to go out places. I know we've sent you guys um, some animals uh, in the past and, and, and lots of other folks too. Uh, so that's a, a real good resource to have an outlet to put some of these animals, other people interested, getting involved, raising animals, um, uh, collecting data in, in some cases. Uh, so so that that's a great thing. Um, but yes, they, they're also, you know, always going to be complications because you're dealing with many, many, many different people and personalities and keeping up with you know, thousands of animals that are out on loan and the paperwork and and the cooperation of, of, of everyone. So that that's always an ongoing process and or struggle at times. So does that answer your question, Anthony? Yeah, that does answer my question. I, I think I, I, I've I've kind of observed things over the years and I've I've been surprised to see like the struggles that like Ray Farrell has gone through with the um, with with the Flavo, the Chinese box turtle uh, yep. taxon management group, and and you know he's produced so many, and he's really been very selfless with the animals, and so many people have had an opportunity to work with these endangered animals that wouldn't normally have that opportunity. And I know that you're in a position where you you want to be PC and everything. I'm not saying that you're hiding something or uh, at all. I'm just saying. Um, there is a negative side to it. And I, I think that people don't understand because sometimes these, some of these populations can be bred very successfully. People don't understand how important it is to take the opportunity seriously and to, you know, so um, to speak a little more to the specifics, basically the one thing that you're asked when you're a part of, of this uh, taxon management group for the Chinese box turtle, uh, Coro Fleva marginata, is to not sell the animals, to report if they die, and then twice a year to send in measurements. That all you have to do is just twice a year, just measure the animals. And, and no one, practically no one measures their animals and sends them back. So they're very happy to take the free animals, but they can't measure the animals twice a year. And I, I don't mean to get you into something, Chris, in, into, down a negative, uh, you know, um, uh, route here, but, but that's something that that personally bothers me and and that really um and that's kind of where i was going with the question but um well, i didn't yeah. necessarily want to bait you into anything either no I, and the, the, the point blank question is fine that that is that is an issue that is a problem and it, it, it's hard to to deal with yes and you know what do you do how do you you blacklist people say okay you can't have any more animals because you won't be great um especially if we find out they're selling them, that's what we do. Uh, it's, it's a hard thing to, to do, you know, to deal with and, and keep up with. It's a lot of animals, and I feel the same way. I've given away 
thousands of turtles to people over the over the past 20 years you know that have come my way people give me so many turtles because they're getting too old or they're dying or they have died or they're just done with it whatever and um and it's just amazing uh you know some people you know are really really good and responsible um but they can all take only so many animals and 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 certain species and it's especially now it seems like it's getting more and more and more all the time every year the number of animals that need placement um, from just your red-eared sliders and sulcatas to <laughs> to just about anything you can imagine um, within reason so so it never ceases to amaze me what, what collections become available year to year and and and, pe and people are getting older and there's still a, a lot of kind of Turtle, turtles out there in people's backyards that they don't even realize or know about. But yeah, it's I, I really do. Yes, it, it, it's a hard thing. The, the Ray the Ray Farrell situation example is, is is a tough one. And and I wish people would cooperate more. You are yeah, you're giving free animals. You're agreeing to do something. Um, and you see that so often people receive you know receive something at, under an agreement of of, of sorts and. And they don't, uh, or, or definite agreement, and then they don't follow it. Happens all the time, unfortunately. Right. right. Have you seen any uh, movement with with um, the TSA or zoos or anything to to work less with the private sector? I don't mean to take this in a negative row again, but I think that um, I, I think that people don't realize they they uh, private hobbyists want to be. A part of the solution so much and they want to call things conservation projects and they want to do more but i don't think they realize how much we as a group uh don't really like hold up our end of the bargain and and give ourselves a good opportunity um to to be like a voice at the table and one thing i always appreciated about the tsa is that they were willing to do that yeah. um but i just wonder about where that's going in the future Hard to tell. I, I don't know. I mean, there's all historically, it's always been, you know, uh, zoos and privates have been very separated in this country. Anyway. Um, now, that's not to say every zoo and every private, because obviously, since the dawn of time, there's always been or dawn of the of the zoo world. Anyway, there have been friends exchanging animals and and, and a lot of zoo animals have made it into private hands in one way or another. Um, going all the way back and some zoos are are willing to do that others won't do it at all so it, it really depends on the individual zoo but I don't I don't see it you know that it's changed you know much over the past over the years in terms of okay there are more zoos giving them out to privates or keeping them I'd say in, in some ways maybe they're, they're, they're allowing more to go out, they, especially animals that they've, they're successful hatching quite a few. And then they have all these F1s, 15, 20, 30, and uh, zoos don't want them, nobody else wants them. So they, they, the only other outlet is going into private hands. And so they try right. to find responsible private people to give them, even if it's a zoo that historically doesn't normally deal with private people, I, I think I've seen a few more willing to in, in recent times. Um, because of that, there, there's there's no more room in zoos for every kind of turtle and, and lots of them. Um, right. So I know that uh, TSA requires uh, um, anybody receiving some of your animals to be a member in good standing for at least two years. Um, what else uh, do you typically uh, require during a vetting process before placing animals with uh, with a private keeper? Well, we just have your a standard uh, animal recipient profile form that you'd fill out and give us, you know, information and references. And you know, if we don't know you, we'd want to check those out and call a couple of people and find out your expertise with the species or turtles in general, um, uh, you know, what your experience is. So that's generally what we do. And then, um, but usually it's people that we know. There aren't too many people that just show up that we, we, we don't right. know or that, we don't know directly. They don't know someone we directly know. So it's all kind of word of mouth thing. So uh, occasionally, you know, we, we, we get new people that we don't know. We have to really um, vet closely. 
All right. Um, so I'm sure one of the things everybody's uh, looking forward to hearing about is everybody likes to hear about the adventures uh, that um, you get to experience going all over the world to conserve turtles. So could you um, maybe tell us about one or two of your favorite trips that you've taken um, to do research or conservation uh, with turtles? Okay. Um, well, I've been a world traveler all my life. Um, I've always been a traveler since I was very young and uh, something I love to do. I love to experience new culture. I'm a, I'm a naturalist. I'm a, I'm a generalist naturalist. I really enjoy um, all of life and, and cultures and community and, and, and getting into whatever situation you find yourself in traveling. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of my favorite places to go are in, in the Indonesian archipelago. That's where I've spent a lot of time. Um, traveling on my own um, uh, since the 90s, late 90s, the first trip I went on. And um, I spent a little more than a year of my life there and traveled to many of the major islands and have seen quite a few turtles and, and other herps uh, throughout the throughout the region. And and uh, that's just, you know, I always think, you know, I, I feel like I was born, you know, a few hundred years too late. I, I wish I could have been an early explorer. Um, and, and doing some of that stuff, getting to deep into the jungles of New Guinea or even like Rhode Island or Sulawesi, where people in some cases have never seen a Westerner before. And, 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 and they can't understand why the hell someone would come all the way around the world to, to see a turtle or a snake or, you know, or, or whatever um, <laughs> in some cases. So, you know, that's always an adventure, but... You know, going out and, and collecting data on, uh, like, Lucas Cephalon, uh, Uonui, um, it was described in 95. I went to Indonesia for the first time in 98 and saw one for the first time. And then went back in 2002 and saw one in the wild for the first time. And, uh, and you know, that was just exciting, being part of a uh, figuring out information about a, a, a species that we didn't know about in the West, the only people on the island of Sulawesi and maybe a few other people really knew about. That's so, amazing. Yeah. Wow. I, you know, I've been there a few times, three times now, I've been back. Last time I was there in 2012 and uh, actually went up into the same stream and still caught turtles a decade later. Um, so it's there and, and, the opportunity to see the the uh, Seabin Rockyella latensis, the Palawan forest turtle, yeah. in, the wild, uh, in 2012, that was an incredible experience, and uh, and uh, not to mention all the crocodilians I've seen in the wild. That's uh, one of my first loves in life too, are, are crocodiles. I have to say, my wife makes fun of me constantly for having the worst tattoos of all time. Every time you and I have been together, I've admired your tattoos. I never told you this one-on-one -on -one because I think that maybe you think I was hitting on you or something, but <laughs> I do. <laughs> most, most men think Anthony's hitting on him, so it's okay. Yeah, I, I'm very polite, yeah, and, and, and imposing, yeah. But I, I just, you do have really good tattoos, and, and a lot of them are based, are crocodilian as well. I, I think that's really cool. And uh, don't just don't be upset if I steal any of your tattooed ideas. It's <laughs> it's imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. You know how that goes. That whole thing. Right. right. Well, I have plenty, and, and I I've been working on doing at least one representative of every family of turtles in the world. But I keep getting caught up on geomida. Like I think I have like twenty geomida turtle geomided turtles on me, and you know, maybe only six families or seven families at this point. So yeah, it's a slow process. And that is so cool. Yeah. So cool. Gosh, I'm sorry. That's just cool. <laughs> Chris, where are you traveling to next for uh, next conservation project? Um, probably Ohio. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's very exotic. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Now, no, no direct plans uh, to go anywhere at the moment. Um, I would like to have gone to the croc meetings uh, this year in Argentina, but I don't think I can afford that this year. So uh, I don't really know. I don't, I, a lot of times my traveling is spontaneous, and, and, and like literally within two or three weeks of planning I'm, or less sometimes, because uh, sometimes it's, uh, even if it's a, a vacation you know sometimes like okay let, i'm just it's time let's just buy a ticket and go to wherever um okay. a lot of times there's not a, a lot of planning 
evolve. And then when there's a spur of a moment event, for instance, like the the big head confiscation in Myanmar, mm -hmm. um, did you go out there or did you send people yeah. out there? I, I was one of the people that went out. Uh, one of the first people that made it there. Um, probably from knowing about it to getting there. I was actually at the um, at a at a conference at, at, at that time at the TCPG conference, um, and so I was delayed by a couple of days because so I had to come back to South Carolina first to go. So it took me like four days to get there. But like the Palawan crisis, I think I was there within like 48 hours. Yeah. Um, so, you know, but yeah, in just a, in, a, in a few days. Um, and in, in the back in the early 2000s, when I would go to Indonesia <laughs> looking for turtles, uh, looking for undescribed turtles, that type of thing. Sometimes we get a chip and I just buy a ticket and get on a plane and go yeah. try to search it down for three or four weeks. Okay. Awesome. So how long have you uh, been officially employed by uh, TSA at this point? And what was your official job before that? Well, um, I have been employed with the TSA since October of 2010. Um, uh, it was a, a position that I kept nagging that we needed. I, I kind of pushed for my position to exist in, in some ways and, and it needed to be there anyway. And uh, so the position was created in 2010. Um, but at the time, I was working at the Savannah River Ecology Laboratory, which is um, part of the University of Georgia, which is in the state of South Carolina, the laboratory. Um, so I did both jobs. I had two full-time jobs. I did about 30 hours a week for each job. Okay. Um, so I had an office at the ecology lab, um, and but I was still under contract employment with the TSA for... Um, three years before we started the Turtle Center. So I was right. at the Ecology Laboratory for 11 years, and, uh, and and the last three of those years, I was TSA and the Ecology Lab, and then okay. transitioned over <laughs> in 2013, in March. Made five-year anniversary in, in a month or, and a half or so. Wow, nice. that went fast. Yeah. 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 Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it hey. goes by really quick. Really, five years went by really quick for sure. Wow, I feel like it was just yesterday when we were when we were seeing like plans about it. Yeah, pretty amazing. Wow. wow, it's changed a lot. I'm looking at stuff that we just had a, an acre and a half cleared this past week at two weeks, and and I just I can look around and see, and I have photos of course too of when we first bought the place, and the place came from a friend of mine, so I've been out here before, so. So he had it was a croc facility, a private croc facility and veterinary clinic and 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 just animal menagerie that he and his wife had here. So um, it, it was it, it's been around in, in, with the herb. The South Carolina herb community has known about it for many years. My ex-wife mm -hmm. had her her rattlesnakes implanted on, in our clinic that we work in, you know, back in the mid 2000s. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question from somebody in the audience. They asked if uh, the TSA ever takes like film crews with them to, you know, document these expeditions. Well, um, not. I don't know if I can't think of any specific film crews. Maybe there has been. That I'm just not thinking of. Um, but certainly, photographs are taken, and there's blogs posted on the website, um, that type of thing. And there's certainly have been probably. Uh, news reports in, in some countries with uh, some of the programs that are happening there. And of course, the people that are on the ground that are employed there, they're in the news all the time. As you know, there's TSA India, there's a program in Myanmar, uh, there, you know, they, there's a program in Colombia and Madagascar. Those people are, live there, are locals, and are on the ground there, and they're, they're dealing with the news and, and, and any publicity uh, with the work that they're doing there as well. But yeah, I can't think of any specific film crew that's gone and done like any type of documentary. Um, but I, I could be wrong about that too. I'm just, I don't, I don't, re I don't remember that. Okay. Thank you. Are there any species, Chris, um, that you think people should have on their radar? Um, I know in the, this, this has gotten a little, screwy since then but in 2012 in the tsa magazine um there uh ben anders wrote an article uh urging people to work with um Klang Tung river turtles um because or, or redneck pond turtles because 
Um, no one seemed to want them. They were cheap at the time. And, <clears throat> excuse me, he, um, he just basically needed more dedicated people to just try to work with the species and, and basically care about them. Are there any species right now that you think are, you know, widely available in the trade or that eventually could benefit from captive breeding or uh, could be a candidate for reintroduction at some point that people just don't have on their radar at this time? Hmm. Such well, no, that's, kind of, that's kind of tough because, you know, you try to be proactive about, about certain things. And I think that's something that a lot of people are trying to do with Conixus um, uh, species, but the, the, the African hingebacks. But, you know, the, the stuff is, is there and, and how we get it back into the wild is still a big question, of course. You know, we, we all like to think about, okay, we're keeping these animals, uh, these conservation collections. And, and yes, they can be if they're managed well and for that. Um, but it's a long road. And, and, and the, the red tape of actually, like, putting them on a plane and sending them to a country to where they're going to be held and then released into the wild and monitored and for years to come to see if it's actually successful. Um, it's so many years that, that, that we have to go on that. And when you think about that, I mean, potentially any species of turtle you, know, you can think about could be in that situation in the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years. Um, right. maybe, maybe not red-eared sliders, but, uh, or yellow-bellied sliders, or, or, or river scooters, or snapping turtles in some cases. But, you know, that it, it's going to happen to a lot more species than I think we, we realize um, in the next 50 years, for sure. <clears throat> So uh, one, of our, one of our viewers um, was asking specifically, uh, and I think the answer is yes, but does TSA work with Batiger borneensis? And I believe you do um, yeah. in one of the, at the center or in, uh, in the more native region? Uh, yes, in Aceh province, uh, northern Sumatra. Um, uh, there's there's a, a man named um, um, uh, Joko there who is – uh, has a project there that he's undertaken, and he's supported by TSA, and and um, and yeah, he's protecting nests on the beach, uh, head starting, uh, doing surveys, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, there there is a wild component uh, program uh, supported by TSA in, in Indonesia, actually. Um, and in captivity, there are some in the in the collection, not the collection here, but in the in the uh, greater TSA collection that are held at zoos. And, right. And, um, and just, just for the people watching, Batiger borneensis is the species formerly known as Caliger, correct? Yes. All right. The painted terrapin, we call them. Right. Beautiful. Love their head, their, the male head in breeding season. Just that bright red, amazing. Mm -hmm. They're okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony, always yeah. got to be contrary. He likes his bland turtles. No. I do like bland turtles. <laughs> Small bland I know, turtles. I tease. Yeah. I tease. <clears throat> bland I'm, turtles are I'm cool just saying, too. I'm just saying. I like my turtles like my coffee. I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Little no brown. sugar, no cream? Yeah. I'm embarrassed. Uh. I have a question, actually. So I don't know if you have updated information on this. I haven't heard anything in a while, and I'm going to pronounce it horribly wrong. I apologize. Rafidus winhoe. Yeah. Uh, what's any process on that of the artificial insemination? That is the, the process with the pair that are in captivity in China. Um, yes, the continued process is to artificially inseminate. Um, that has not been successful as of yet after several years of trying. Those, both those animals are very old. Um, the male's penis may not be working properly anymore. Um, he may have a low sperm. I think he does have a low sperm count as well. Um, but those are really old. Those animals, I think, are potentially in the 80 to 100-year-old range um, okay. based on their known history or their reported history, let's say that. Um, and uh, there is the, the one animal in Dongmo Lake in, in, in northern Vietnam. And there have potentially been a couple other sightings, but there are teams working hard in Vietnam to locate other living individuals um, in the wild. So um, 
You know, this is an animal that was still being hunted and collected in the late 90s and early 2000s. And, you know, 10 years ago, there were still several around. And now we're down to three that we know of for sure. Um, but there, there's, I think, a good chance that there are at least a few more out there. Um, it's a lot of work to find a soft shell turtle in a big yeah. expanse of uh, river system, floodplains, lakes. Very, That's amazing. Very yeah. large, though, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They get gigantic, yeah, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on, on uh, as far as, like, they're, like, the turtle equivalent of megafauna? Uh, like, people will make the argument, like, should you save them when there's three left and it's kind of a losing battle, but that there's other species that we might lose that are um, may, perhaps less <coughs> enigmatic, less, less um, attractive, smaller in size, um, that sort of thing. Not to necessarily say that that uh, that raffidus are the most attractive animals in the world, but do you get what I'm saying? Like, like yeah, a, a less a less sexy topic, a less a less, a less sexy species. Um, yeah, you, for you, for less money. I think you know I'd be preaching to to reptile people because who else knows about that? And, you know, a few other turtles. Yes, it's a national. People know about it in Vietnam for sure because of lots of campaigns with uh, children and stuff, but. But yeah, that's not a widely known species, I don't think. But no, if you're going to spend the time trying to save them, anything, you know, might as well. You know, what, what do you have to lose? Um, uh, you get them to breed. I mean, it's a turtle. How many turtles have been washed downstream or out to an island, and whole populations or or have sprung up from one or two individuals? It's, it, you know, I, I wouldn't say you throw in the towel just because there's only a few individuals left. Right. But not, not with a turtle anyway. Right, right. Great point. Uh, but yeah, there are a lot of other turtles too out there that nobody knows or cares about. And they're just as going right out the door. Cora joey, um, Cora ara capitata, um, you know, uh, uh, hoagie, down at Musoclemmy's hoagie. And there's animals that there aren't that many left of. and. They have very small ranges, as far as we know, and and they're 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 going. They're they're out the door, and nobody knows about them. Nobody really pays attention to them, except for turtle freaks. Right. Which I'm proud to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Chris, do you have a like a personal highlight from your work in the field? Something that sticks with you, you know, most. Well, I'd have to say probably going back to, again, to my 2002 trip in, in Borneo and Sulawesi, um, uh, encountering leucocephalon in the wild for the first time, that was, that was an incredible experience for me. And just being able to contribute to that animal's natural history, I mean, that's just kind of a dream of mine of, you know, being on a ship with Alfred. <laughs> So being Alfred Wallace and, and, and sailing around the Malay Archipelago, you know, in the 1800s, that would have that would have been great. And so I got a little taste of that um, and traveling around in New Guinea, um, finding uh, going from river system to river system and looking at all the differences and what has been described essentially as uh, Kiladina rhymani, which is it's like looking at map turtles across the southeastern U.S. Mm -hmm. Every river drainage has a slightly different turtle in it you know so you know that kind of stuff it is probably sticks out the most just the adventure of it because it's always a, a near-death experience most days uh, and watching people you know getting sick around you and even dying around you from tropical diseases and yeah and and you know on the toilet non-stop you know all that kind of stuff that goes along with um uh, some of that and being Sometimes a little bit unsafe, but but you know it's all part of the adventure um, because the people there they they just live the way they live and and you just kind of fall into it. Man, my life is so boring. <laughs> <laughs> it's the worst. I have the worst life. Oh, can can we talk a little more about Sulawesi? I know you already touched upon Leucocephalon, which is which is yep. the Sulawesi forest turtle, and then there's also um, the Forston tortoise, which which is endemic to Sulawesi. Now you've tracked both species in the wild. Which one is more rare? 
Well, I have never actually seen Forsteni in the wild. Um, I've gone out looking for them many times, or the times that I've been there, and never seen one. Gone out with trackers and with dogs and never seen one, but I've seen a lot of Iwanoi. So I don't know if it's just a, a matter of the, the localities that, that, where I was um, or if Forstens really are. I, I do believe that Forstens should be critically endangered just the same as, as Iwanoi is, but um, which one is actually truly rare would be a complete guess on anybody's part since no no real studies have ever been done on either of those species. We don't right. even know the extent of their, of their geographic ranges. Um, but from my personal experience, I've never been able to find one in the wild, even though they, the two species occur together. They're sympatric. They bump nose. They run into each other in the field for sure. Um, and in the habitat, they share habitat. <coughs> so in some parts, now there are areas where forestins are, where you never find a Uanawai, but there are areas where there are Uanawai, where you will find forestins as well. Very cool. That's actually why I asked the question. Um, I assumed that Yuanawai was more rare, um, but uh, for the force and sort of seems to be um, declining so fast. And I knew that, that the last time or the time before last that you were there, that you guys didn't find one because I think it was in the 2012 uh, TSA magazine, yeah. if, I, if I recall. Yeah. So that's why I was wondering, since you would obviously look for both species. But that's really interesting. I always run into people in the field there. It's, oh, yeah, I saw one right over here two weeks ago. Or, yes, I caught one two weeks ago, and here it is <laughs> in, in this pit in my village. Um, right. But I have not been able to find one. But that could just also be it's a tortoise, and they're, you know, you want to why it comes down to the water. They, they hang out in three inches of water, and so in a, in a three-foot-wide stream, and that's where they are. <laughs> and you just right. walk along them up. <laughs> You know, you mentioned, uh, you know, conservation status is with those animals. And I think one thing that might be important for our viewers to recognize is that um, the statuses that we use uh, to talk about these animals, many of them, it's nearly impossible to keep them constantly up to date, even the ones that have been studied well, um, because you could, you know, not go check populations for three or four years and all of a sudden something will happen that could have decimated the population via people pulling them out of the wild to anything else. And, and there are plenty, like you said, that just haven't really even been studied. So <clears throat> at the same time, we need to look at a conservation status of only like vulnerable or near threatened as kind of a, at the same time as that's, uh, that's sort of better than endangered or critically endangered. We need to kind of look at that with a grain of salt and be like, Hey, the fact that the, the, the trend is that they're still declining is still a concern because um, it's been five years since this this has been assessed. Yeah, yeah, that it is, and it, it's the whole concept of keeping common species common too. I mean, don't wait until the right. last until there's a 500 left. Go, let's do something about it. No, you want you want to put core on CITES one, put core amboinensis on CITES one. They're the one that is covers 3,000 miles and and all many different uh, taxa that are littered throughout there. And they're just traded all over the place, you know, being yeah. mixed up and, and uh, you know, tens of thousands a year, not hundreds of thousands of a year being collected still. Wow. Yeah. Or Russian tortoises. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. So what can we, what can we do and what can our viewers do to support the incredible work that you and your colleagues do? Um, every day? Well, there's always um, just being proactive supporter and talking to people and getting the word out and trying to educate people about not only turtles, but just the state of, of wildlife and, and habitats in general. And, you know, the, I, I do like the whole concept of setting aside, you know, 50% of the planet or something for, for habitats and wildlife. I mean, that that's great stuff but you know yes contributing obviously monetarily uh, through monetary donations or goods donations to support different um uh programs that, that are around the world um 
and you know, I mean, the TSA doesn't do this all, all by itself. It, 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 it's, it's a partnership. The TSA has always been a partnership. Um, the TSA is not not loaded. It has tons of money. To, it, 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 it it's a lot of bang for its buck, and it has for many years. Um, but things, programs keep growing. The needs keep growing. More things come up. We you identify more people and more countries that are that are on the ground doing work. Um, that are they're interested and they need they need help to do what they do really well. And so um, it's this you know supporting all those range country programs uh, and the on on the ground conservation efforts that all these people are doing around the world um, is 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 extremely important to keep that going. Um, and just you know, giving those people the tools and and that they need to to help them get where they want to be and and do what they want to do, which is help turtles in their in their neighborhoods, <laughs> um, which are you know here it's it's a it's an easy con in our country in the United States it's a it's a easy concept of yeah we don't go out and just collect all of our animals usually and, and kill them for whatever reason or send them to. The market for whatever reason, although we do to some degree, um, but we there's a lot of conservation mindedness, and there's a lot of places that are way, way, way behind that, um, kind of maybe where we were, you know, a few hundred years ago, so or a couple hundred years ago. At any rate, it's the exploitation is is, is happening because you know a lot of these places want to be like Europe and Asia and other developed countries in the world. Um, uh, and that means destroying all their resources to get there often, unfortunately. So th there has to be ways around that. So that I, you know, that, that, it, that's a tough question because people always ask, what can we do to get involved? Or, or people that ask, say, okay, well, I'm keeping these species. I have these groups of animals. How can I get involved? What, what can I do to make a, an impact? And it's a really tough question because, yeah, we all have groups of turtles in our backyards or in well-managed conservation centers or in our basements, and we're doing really well at different levels. And, and uh, what do we do with all these animals? That's always the question. How do we, how do we get this group effort to in partnership to make it all one cohesive um, uh, captive conservation effort um, and, and so of all doing these individual things um, and, and where does it really get to it's obviously concert we all know conservation really mostly happens on the ground where it's happening you know in the range country or place that 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 the, the situation is occurring and people caring and stepping up and doing something about it and, you know, that leads me to my, my, my next question. That was a perfect segue into it, too. I think you, you have been so involved in every important turtle-related happening the past 20 years, like everything. And no, it really is – you really have. You really have. In my eyes, anyway, for whatever that's worth. But, but it's an honor just to have you on the show. Like, to think four years ago when we started this that we would have you on this show – makes me want to cry tears of joy. I think it's amazing that you're here and, and you're giving us your time. I really appreciate it. But I'm wondering, as you've seen things develop over time, I think, you know, 20 years ago, roughly, it was such you know, such an eye-opening thing when people started to, to look at the Asian turtle crisis, which is still such a horrible crisis. But now it's starting to deplete turtles from all over the world, including here in the U.S. that are being illegally smuggled overseas. Um, how have you seen things kind of change over time? And um, what are the TSA's plans uh, around American turtles? Because I see what you do with NAFTA. We work with NAFTA closely, um, the, the North American Freshwater Turtle Research Group, and they research turtles in the wild at several locations in, in Texas and Florida and in the north and all, and all over. And... and um, I see that, but I'm wondering what's, how is the TSA getting involved with these, you know, American confiscations? Um, obviously, you guys have a voice at the table for, for that sort of stuff, I would assume. But what does that look like for you? And how have you seen that sort of stuff change over the past 20 years? Well, as, as you mentioned, it's, it's not really just an Asian turtle crisis. It is a world turtle crisis. 
Um, turtles are being sucked out of every corner of the globe um, to feed different trades, whether it be traditional Chinese medicine or traditional medicines elsewhere, um, the pet trade and the food trade. So, and then there's also just the, the normal subsistence uh, hunting and uh, habitat degradation, destruction, pollution, all that kind of stuff that goes into it. Um, but yeah, when I was in 1983, I was 11 years old and I joined um, my local herb society in Dayton, Ohio. And, um, you know, things were different. I looked at, I get my, my colored price list from, from uh, Tom Crutchfield, Herp de Fauna back then, you know, and, and you'd see things like, you know, or, or Louis Porras, Zoo Herp. Um, and, and you'd see, you know, Cora R. Capitata, $175, you know, rare, $175, or, or, or uh, Cora Trifasciatas for $25 or $50, or bog turtles, $100. Um, you know, all, all, all that kind of stuff. And, and it, there wasn't this big, yes, there were conservationists back then, but there wasn't this huge conservation mindset of, oh, well, turtles are in trouble all over the world. Things are just, you know, kind of neat. You know, we go out, when I was a kid, I'd go out and collect painted turtles and take them home, keep them for a while, or soft shell turtles just to kind of watch them and keep them and feed them. And, and, and I spent most of my time out in, in the creeks and, and, uh, and I watched a lot of stuff where I grew up, just in around you know, a suburb of Dayton, Ohio, go away. We had a little relic population of spotted turtles that I could go and find, and Massasauga rattlesnakes, 30 minutes from my house, um, which was a real rarity. Uh, Kirtland's water snakes, and, and, and that stuff's like all gone, you know. Um, yeah, that was 30 some years ago, but it, it, it's happening everywhere, uh, unfortunately. And I just don't see it getting any better at all. Uh, other than little wins here and there. Um, but as we progress 10 years ago, 20 years ago, every decade, it just, yeah, we recognize that we're doing stuff. We are making, uh, we are successful in some areas, some places, um, but it's still happening at a great rate. As far as the United States goes, yeah, all the confiscations that are leaving here. Yes, we, we've dealt with that a little bit. We've, 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 either consulted fish and wildlife or we've held a few animals here and there. Not, I don't think any U.S. native species, um, but there needs to be a dedicated U.S. fish and wildlife confiscation facility for turtles and or, you know, reptiles or something, something, uh, some multi, some big facility that needs to be, be built or, or purchased to deal with this kind of stuff because it's happening all the time. And people are overwhelmed with what they receive, whether it's here or other countries. Um, when you get a thousand turtles dropped in your lap, I mean, no matter what they are, it's a lot to deal yeah. with. Um, wow. <clears throat> even a hundred is tough. Yes, yeah, so even a hundred is yeah. tough, depending on the species. A hundred Claudius <laughs> or 300 Claudius dumped in your lap. <laughs> they all going to be kept oh. in tubs or a or hundred or 500 or 900 platy sternin. Yes, yeah. it, it's... Uh, it's a tough thing to deal with. And, and yeah, the TSA has talked about getting involved with some U S things, but yeah, we have the, that, that group, the, the, um, the, the, the freshwater research group, the turtle research group, um, here that we partner with. Um, but you know, it's really the job of us fish and wildlife service to take care of this stuff. And, and that's what they do. We're not trying to duplicate efforts. If, there's something we can do to help and we have the resources and it, there comes a day that, that we need to uh, manage bog turtles in captive colonies. That's the only place they're left or kegels, map turtles, or, or, you know, whatever it may be. Um, then, then maybe the TSA would get involved in something like that. Mm -hmm. Hey, you say kegels, map turtle. Is that the rarest map turtle? That's one of them. Yeah. I want to ask you, because Steve tries to act like he knows about map turtles, but I don't want to. <laughs> I, I don't. I want to go straight to the to the source here, and ask somebody who really knows. I'm just kidding, everyone. You can't see my face. I'm sorry. I'm just. I'm just kidding. Jeez, take it easy, Steve. You're getting all red in the face. 
I don't know the name of it. Uh, there's a map turtle in, that's solely in Texas, right? That's like that's it's Kaggles is solely in Texas. Raptimus Versa is solely in Texas. Um, Gibbon's eye is very endangered in the wild, based on Peter Lindemann's surveys and his work. Yeah, <clears throat> you see how I I quite I I, I question him a little bit, and now he's got to prove. See. That's good. When he He's, said Versa, for everyone at home, when he said Versa, he that's the Texas map turtle. Yeah. Just for everyone to know that. Tests. So, yeah, Steve knows that the Texas map turtle is from Texas. So, everyone <laughs> give him a round of applause. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Thanks. Chris, there's a couple of questions from the audience <laughs> that I think are pretty interesting. Definitely. Uh, so, one, can you comment on the recent influx in availability of Mexican terrapine and the history of the legal export? of the Mexican turtle species? Great question. That is, um, so I cannot give any specifics or details on the, the legalities of exporting turtles from Mexico. I know that it's been closed for a long time. There haven't been legal exports. How far that goes back, I don't, I don't know the exact dates uh, for that country. I just know it's been closed for a long time. And yes, there has been an influx of many illegal Arapini Mexicana, uh, uh, Yucatanas, Nelson, I, uh, other, other, um, um, Claudius, other, other turtles from Mexico and other her herp species from Mexico, not to, ju not just to the United States, but to markets in Asia as well. Um, so yes, there have been a lot. It's really unfortunate. And there's just been this huge spike in the past few years. How they're, well, I mean, I don't know the routes. I don't know how, it, I don't know the details of how it's happening. I just know that it is happening. Um, and uh, a lot of those animals aren't making it, I think. They're, they're, they're tough to acclimate. And again, you know, animals are held and they, they go through, um, you know, all kinds of stressors being held and sent from one place to another. A lot of times by the time they get to you, they're in pretty bad shape uh, from secondary infections or, or whatnot. Uh, from the stress of what they've been through, dehydrated most of the time, um, sometimes starving if they've been held for many months, that type of thing. So, yeah, it, it is it is unfortunate to to see all that going on. And a lot of these species don't have <clears throat> ranges either. How long can that go on? Um, especially when you see lots of them going to China as well. Um, another one that uh, you know I know is uh, species TSA is is involved with um, country that everybody's familiar with, everybody's aware of as um, just things are, are happening badly for reptiles there um, right now. Uh, Madagascar, particularly um, uh, the, the plowshare uh, tortoise. Um, I mean, it's not the question simple. Are they doomed? And I mean, that's a, that's a tough question for sure. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, when, when I was a kid, that was that was the poster, ch one of the poster children for endangered tortoises. And I still have my this really old poster in Malagasy about about the plowshare tortoise and how endangered it is. That I got probably like 1984 or something. And um, so, yeah, I, I've been told my whole life that this tortoise is on, on its way out. It's critically endangered and only a few hundred left or a couple thousand left. And and. Uh, and and they're they're going because they people won't stop collecting them. And then you see now with social media and 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 reptile classifieds, you see them for sale all the time in Kuala Lumpur and and uh, Guangdong and you know areas in Southeast Asia where there are big reptile markets, Jakarta. Um, and these these you gotta wonder how do they keep coming? Yes, they're all small ones, smaller ones usually. But they're all just going, going, going. Um, and for an animal that was already so supposedly so few left, and you see 2,000 market over the past 10 years, um, yeah, you you gotta wonder how how long how much longer they have. Now they yes, they're some protected areas. I've never been there myself. Um, uh, colleagues of mine certainly have much more deeper insight than I do. I just uh, know what I know from reading reports and talking to people, but it's a tough one. That's going to be a really tough one to, to keep around when you have these animals that have such a high bounty on their heads in the, uh, in the black market. It is, 
so difficult to to protect them. Um, and, and you know, it's a sad thing to see. But they're there still. They are there still. They're not yeah. gone yet. Um, so we, they're, they're still hope. I have to apologize for both us and our viewers that this this show, this episode has taken such a morbid turn. We, we have this exciting <laughs> guest on. We got Chris Hagen, the, the, literally the turtle god, is here to talk to us. <laughs> And we and we just go super dark on everybody. I'm I'm I apologize. I did you know, not see this coming. Really? No, I I did foresee this coming because you work with a lot of crises. Uh, crises. Yeah. Uh, crises. Yeah. Crises. Crises. He's yeah. easy to talk to, though. He's also easy to talk to. I think that's part of it too. And yeah. and he's a straight shooter. He's always transparent. He's a good guy. And he's you know he's not going to fluff it up or anything like that too. So I think we're we're taking advantage of that. I apologize. That sometimes, that sometimes gets me in trouble though too. Like, <laughs> right. That's why, that's why I apologize. Right. I don't want to get in trouble tomorrow at work because you're telling us stuff you're not supposed to or anything. That's why. Please, just for all the viewers out there, Chris has the right to say no. So if he says no to us or you, then that's okay. Just we're, we're gonna we're gonna get through this. All I know is I don't take anything for granted. I've been. My entire life, I mean, I've been able to be a herpetologist. I've never really had to do anything else, which, yeah, I'm not rich. I don't own anything. <laughs> you know, I barely get by, but I've traveled the world, and I've uh, researched turtles, studied turtles, hung out with turtles, and other wildlife and lots of cultures my entire life, and I don't take that for granted one minute. I have a lot of wonderful friends that have helped get me here. Um, in one way or another, uh, in terms of knowledge and understanding, and uh, um, uh, just getting into, you know, having the opportunities that I've had um, throughout my life um, to, to be able to travel the world and work for universities and nonprofit organizations and and just do freelance herpetology for thirty years. <laughs> so it's great. So cool. Uh, I have another question from the viewers, and this could be taken as, you know, hypothetical or whatnot. Um, what are your thoughts on the process, the possibility of cloning extinct species? Oh, wow. What are my thoughts on it? Yeah, and, just you uh, personally. Not You're not speaking to me today. Park. You're speaking on yourself. Yeah. yeah. Colonial yeah. Park. Uh, whatever. Much safer. I, if, if it can be done, it can be done. You know, I'm, I have no problem with it. Yeah. No one's ever artificially, I don't think anyone's ever successfully artificially inseminated a turtle yet. So we'll, we'll see about cloning. Got some, some work ahead of us, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I mean, whatever. People want to clone stuff, go go for it. I have no problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and another one here. Um, how about some of the successes, you know? So they noted that there's been several, several positive notes on several Badger species. Yeah. Several other ex, you know, in situ or ex situ captive breeding successes of like platysterna and rare cora, etc. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there are successes in terms of uh, uh, you know we have the, the the Burmese star tortoise was considered functionally extinct by the mid '90s, and now mm -hmm. they're re-releasing them and they're breeding in the wild again, and and there are over a thousand out in the wild again in a couple of sanctuaries. Um, so. That's the okay. biggest one I think of. Yeah, that, that's a great. That's a great one. And yeah, just you know, the nest protection and bat, you know, Badiger trivitata. You know, all these animals that you know, we or you know people considered were extinct. You know, every time. Oh well, they're not really extinct. Whether it's Coral unanestis, Badiger trivitata, um, which was used to be Kachuga trivitata, um, the Burmese root turtle, the Arakan forest turtle, the Yosemite depressa. Um, you know, all these animals were extinct. They're extinct. We haven't seen them forever. The Philippine forest turtle, Latensis. Oh, they must be extinct because no one's seen them in all these years. No, they, they were still out there, luckily. And uh, we, we did get to rediscover them, or people did, and, and we all get to benefit from that. And, and now uh, the, the task is at hand to, to do something with that knowledge and not, and not uh, throw it all away. Um, yeah. And make it true that they are extinct. You know, uh, we'll see how that all that goes. But yeah, there are definitely breeding successes in captivity. I mean, things like Coramacordae that are, you know, probably down to the last few individuals in the wild, if there are any left at all. You know, Coramacordae is a is a really neat hardy turtle that breeds really well in captivity, and and if done right, 
yes, we could read hundreds of them over the next, uh, you know, decade or more. And and if there's a protected area, maybe they could, because they come from a, such a, uh, a narrow range that we could put them back in the wild. Same with Moremi's nigger cans or uh, Caledina McCordy, Rhode Island, um, the snake neck turtles. Um, so there, there are some animals, I think, that, that, that are close to extinction in the wild that captive breeding can help by augmenting populations or, or totally reintroducing populations through captive breeding if things are set up properly. Um, things that have really wide ranges, um, geographic ranges, that, that, that gets a little trickier, obviously. Where do you put those animals at? That's, that such, a, that's such an important <laughs> piece of information that you never hear anyone talk about. And there's so many folks that try that try their hand at like conservation and what really what what the private sector does is more like preservation of species than conservation of species. And and you never hear that. You that's such a fundamental and and important little gem of information that is just the way it is for you and just blows my mind because you never hear it. Uh, I, I really appreciate you sharing that. So just to reiterate species with large a large range it's going to be more difficult because there's going to be genetic variation across the range um and for these species that have a very small range that just come from one little area it's it's going to be much easier when you know what you have and you know where it came from originally and you can reintrodu reintroduce it without risking you know muddying the gene pool in, in the in, in the wild because conservationists will not do that uh, the way that we do in our captive, in our in our captive operations, and that's why it's so important for us to be careful what we're doing. That's why so many I see a lot of people in in Europe really being a lot more mindful of um, locale locality. It's not even it's not even necessarily the species or subspecies, but it's where did it come from? And if you don't know where it came from, then you know you're not going to have much of a leg to stand on when you try to call it a conservation project. And I think there's still a range of beliefs in there too, even you know, from a conservation mind, is you have you have the camp that's like, okay, well, what's more important, having this pure animal or that's gone from the wild or having the animal back there filling that niche, that's, that's ecological right. niche and doing its job in the environment. Um, okay, so, you know, Moramius anamensis and Moramius mudica, they hybridize naturally in the wild. As, because this anamensis has... 10 or 12 percent mudica genes in it should it should it not be back out in the wild doing its job but a species that has pretty much been completely wiped out and yeah you know, i don't know you know that, that that's a philosophical debate that people have but um does everything have to be pure uh for, to, for it to go back uh, genetically pure to its its exact you know range um or is filling the niche more important but I feel like this is this this gets to the core of of the 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 difficulties in conservation because you're up you're fighting this losing battle like like you're protecting animals from from poachers who just have seemingly all the resources they need and all the time in the world and all the need for that turtle where we don't have enough money to pay people to protect it and then you know and then it, there's always kind of this this losing battle and again i'm getting dark and morbid and and uh pessimistic about things but um i think you know we try to do things the right way and sometimes i guess maybe it gets in the way a little bit like the bureaucracy of it maybe and um yeah that's that's um it could be frustrating for me i and i know one percent of what you know i know one tenth of a percent of what you know and um I could I could see it already. Yeah. Just saying. So, All right. Chris, don't fall asleep on me. Uh, we have another question. Gotten... Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just, uh, you go, uh, Kevin, and then I'll, I think we'll wrap up after that. I was going to ask him one question to wrap up. So. Okay. Yeah, so one last question was, why do you believe keepers have so many problems historically hatching offspring with the Galbinifron complex. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. I, you know, I, I asked myself that 
the same question sometimes thinking about the species that i've kept for 10 or 15 or even 20 years and then ne never hatched one and then all of a sudden started hatching them every year after 10 or 12 or 15 years um i don't know if some of it's just the, the longevity of, of uh, or the, the you know animal being moved and coming new into a collection and it really just takes time with some of these species to really be comfortable and really acclimated before they, they start reproducing. I also wonder if there is an individual compatibility. Just because you put two animals together doesn't mean they're compatible to be breeding and, and reproducing. Um, I think there's a lot of factors involved with it, but um, it seems like once you do have animals that are acclimated and do start breeding, then those animals keep doing that year after year after year. And and but I think just sometimes it takes a decade or more uh, for that to happen. Yeah, if there's if there's one thing we can truly learn from turtles and tortoises, it's patience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like you just can't rush them into anything. Get them acclimated, let them get them happy, but it, sometimes it just takes <coughs> patience. Yeah. So I mean some of my biggest disappointments are Noda Achilles platinoda, the flatback turtle, and its sister taxon, Leucocephalon uonui. I've kept both those species, you know, for a long, long, long time, and I've never been able to hatch one myself. Um, but I had things like Yosemite spinosa and platysternin that took me almost 15 years before of keeping them and mm -hmm. even getting eggs. I mean, I had 100 uonui eggs in my life, and I've never been able to hatch one. So, um, Wow. It's, it's one of those things that's very frustrating, but sooner or later it's going to happen. It's a patience. Yeah. And, so, wow. and getting the right combination of stuff going on, I guess. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I know. Um, you know, we've been fighting with, uh, with uh, Cursine uh, Angulata. Yeah. You know, just can't seem to find the right combo to get the animal to hatch. Yeah. Get it within, you know, a couple weeks and, and then it's over. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so to wrap up, I know you, you know you've mentioned how you've got you've been blessed to be able to basically live your life as a herpetologist for 25 uh, years or so. Um, <clears throat> we always have people who ask, um, <clears throat> "What can I do to to get into this for 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 life?" Especially from you know um, teenagers, high school students. Um, yeah you know, as they're trying to plan for college or whatever. So what advice um, could you give um, anybody from 10 to 25 who wants to spend the rest of their life um, being a herpetologist for lack of a better term? Sure. I, I get this question. I mean, things are different now than they were, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, of course. But um, I think it's still fun fundamentally it's, no, if you want, if that's what you want, you have to make it happen. You need to learn the stuff. You need to, just because you love turtles, because you love sea turtles or you love animals, doesn't mean you will understand them. You, you have to put in the time. You don't become a turtle expert from reading a couple of books and, and, and reading some things online in a year or two. It, it, you know, it takes years and years of, just like anything else, practice and 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 being around stuff, going to meetings, reading things and and finding things that you like to read and track those people down and go ask them questions or go to a conference where they're gonna be and listen to their talks and then approach them and start talking to them and getting involved. I mean, obviously we know that getting jobs has a lot to do with being in the right place at the right time and knowing people and, and, and your experience. Um, so, Getting as much experience as you can in a field that you want to be involved in, um, it, especially this field, because it's very competitive because lots of people want to work with animals because they like animals, and you really need to be ahead of the game. You really need to prove and show, used really, not, all, not always. Sometimes people that don't really necessarily deserve to be where they are get there for one reason or another. Um, but... Uh, the, your colleagues that are uh, experts in your field, you know, know if you're an expert or not by talking to you. So you you spend that time. You just do it in time. You 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 read. 
you you experience uh, things. I mean, not everything revolves around captive husbandry. You go out in the field and you learn stuff and you hang out with the experts and you go to meetings and 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 you just absorb everything that you can and and make it happen. You just you just like anything else. You if you want something, you have to get up off your ass and make it happen. Woo. Is there is there an educational path you recommend with that, or just get to know stuff and stuff will kind of if you pursue it enough, you'll find the right path. Well, educationally, yes. I mean, generally, you, you want to get a degree in biology or zoology. Um, focus on herpetology. If you can find a school that still has a herpetology lab, there are no degrees in herpetology if that's what you're specifically interested in, but you get a degree in biology and you specialize in herpetology. Um, or if you want to go into the, the medicine, I mean, there's different fields even within, obviously, herpetology, biology. Um, you, you can be a field researcher. You can work in the, in the zoo and aquarium uh, world. You can, you can work in, even in politics and legislation. Um, there, there's lots of ways to work with wildlife that doesn't necessarily involve keeping 400 turtles in your backyard. Um, but um, that's always, you know, part of the fun too. Uh, so, <laughs> so yeah, you want to get a, these days. You certainly wanted to get a degree. I, I think it's rare that just having the knowledge alone will get you some of the jobs that you might want in in, in an advanced, you know, kind of um, a position uh, through herpetology or biology. So. You definitely want to go ahead and, and get a degree of, of, of some sort in the biological field. I mean, there's there's obviously microbiology, genetics, and there's, there's a whole all kinds of stuff that can be done related to herpetology, where you yeah. can still do it and, and still be doing conservation work, even from from a laboratory and pipetting stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, thanks, Chris. Good stuff. Yeah. Thanks for awesome. having me, guys. No, thanks so much for joining. We really appreciate it. This, like you know, you were saying before, this is a big deal getting somebody with your caliber on board here. Thanks. I'm glad I could be here. Anytime. Just let me know. Let me know if you ever need a, a bodyguard down there, because because <laughs> because I'd die for you. Sure. You, we have a couple of dog kennels, and we can probably put us one more in between. You can guard dogs. It needs to be a pretty big kennel for Anthony. I know, yeah. That sounds terrific. Yeah. That sounds terrific. Yeah. He'll be good with a pillow yeah. if he gets to play with turtles all day. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> well, on that note, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining us here for uh, the podcast, episode 43. Um, we wouldn't be uh, doing the here uh, doing this without all of you watching every week. Um, Chris, as uh, Kevin and Anthony said, we're so glad you were able to join us and um, – Hopefully we can do this again sometime. Um, if I don't see you before then, I will see you in Fort Worth in August. All right. Thanks for having me, guys. Have a good night. Thanks. All right, you Bye. too. Bye-bye.